Becca Melshani, nicknamed Becky, was a 22-year-old woman living with her boyfriend, Daniel Durier, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Becky and Daniel had an on-again, off-again relationship, and the relationship was described as volatile. Both had been arrested for assaulting each other multiple times. In May of 2007, Becky was arrested for punching Daniel in the face after they had an argument about a phone call that Becky had received from her ex-husband, Wesley Bartle. In October of that same year, Daniel was arrested for assault after Becky claimed that he had used a stun gun on her nearly 20 times. The case would eventually be dismissed. In January of 2008, Becky rekindled her relationship with her ex-husband, Wesley Bartle. Daniel was furious, and he hacked into Becky's MySpace page and posted nude photos of her. Becky filed charges against Daniel, but a few days later, Becky and Daniel reconciled, and Becky got back together with him. On March 28th, Becky and Daniel went to Becky's parents' house. While there, the couple reportedly had a heated argument. Becky's sister stated, quote, He started yelling at her. She kept saying that she didn't want to leave. We kept telling her to stay, but Daniel insisted that she left with him. That was the last time I ever saw her. Becky was last seen at around 1.15 a.m. on March 29th on the 100 block of West Rock Rimmon Boulevard, Colorado Springs, Colorado. On the evening of March 31st, police went to Becky's apartment in order to do a welfare check. Her apartment was located on the 6,000 block of Twin Oaks Drive near Academy in Dublin. While approaching the apartment, the officers heard a distinct gunshot sound. Upon entering the apartment, they found Daniel's body. He had shot himself. Becky was nowhere to be found. There was no sign of a struggle inside the apartment. A search was conducted for Becky, but no sign of her has ever been found. Police searched Daniel's red Toyota 4Runner and found evidence, which has not specifically been released to the public, indicating that foul play was involved in Becky's disappearance. Police revealed that Daniel had driven his car to a park in Teller County just hours after Becky was last seen on March 29th. A search of the park found no sign of Becky, however. Daniel took his own life one day before he was scheduled to appear in court for harassment and computer crime charges he committed in January when he hacked into Becky's MySpace account. Becky's ex-husband is not considered a suspect in her disappearance. Police believe that Daniel murdered Becky and dumped her body before committing suicide. However, there is no way to verify it. Her case remains open and unsolved. Becky is described as being 5'5", five five, weighing 115 pounds, with a fairy tattoo on her lower back and pierced ears. She has blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair. Sharon Pryor was a 16-year-old girl living with her mother in Point St. Charles, Montreal, Canada. Her family and friends described her as a kind, friendly, and reliable teenager who stayed out of trouble. Her sisters, who are twins, said that she loved animals and wanted to become a veterinarian. On Saturday evening, March 29, 1975, Sharon spent her day painting Easter eggs for the upcoming Easter holiday. After having dinner with her family, Sharon left her home to meet up with friends at Marina's Pizzeria, as she often did on weekends. It had started to drizzle, and Sharon was hesitant to go out, as she did not want her suede jacket to be ruined. Her mother assured her that the jacket would be fine. A friend watched her cross the street in front of her home at around 7 p.m., the pizzeria was only a five-minute walk from her home, but she never made it. Her friends at the pizzeria assumed that she had met up with her boyfriend and had gone with him to his hockey game. Later that night, when Sharon did not come back home, her mother, Yvonne, became worried. Sharon often went out on weekends, but would always return home by 11 p.m., and she would always call her mom and say she was going to be late. Worried, Yvonne called Sharon's friends but they told her that Sharon had never shown up at the pizzeria. So she called her boyfriend, but he had not seen her either. Yvonne reported her missing to the police. A search was conducted involving police, friends, family, and volunteers from the community, but to no avail. 
Yvonne went on TV, making a public plea for the safe return of her daughter. Four days later, Sharon's body would be found in a field at Chimont, Dulot, and Guimont Boulevard by a beekeeper. The beekeeper had received a phone call from a friend that his gate leading into the field was open. He would often close the gate as the field was sometimes used as a dumping ground. When he went to close the gate, he found Sharon's body and notified police. Sharon had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. She was found wearing her suede jacket, a sweater, shoes, and socks. Her jeans were found a few feet away, and her underwear were found on a nearby branch. An autopsy revealed that Sharon's time of death was around 20 hours prior to her body being found. It is believed that she had been held captive for three days before being killed. Police also believed that Sharon may have still been alive when her body was dumped in the field, as when she was found, she was clutching branches in her hands. At the crime scene, police found a tire truck about 15 feet away, suggesting that she was carried in a car before being dumped. Police also found a size 8.5 shoe print near the gate, suggesting that a person with a smaller build was involved. Police also found a man's shirt, which was used to bind Sharon at the crime scene, but this was a shirt of a larger man, weighing somewhere around 90 kilograms, or about 200 pounds, and most likely standing around 6 feet in height. Police wondered if two people were involved in the murder. Police were able to recover DNA from the crime scene. Sharon had a partial piece of duct tape dangling from her hair, suggesting that she had been gagged. In the course of their investigation, police discovered that just before Sharon's disappearance, a woman had been attacked with a knife in the same area earlier around 7 p.m. The assailant ran away after the woman screamed and some people rushed to the scene. Some speculated that the same man could have run into Sharon and abducted her while he was running away from attacking the previous woman. The woman who was attacked just before Sharon went missing picked out a man from a lineup but she was not sure if it was the same man, so the police had to let him go. Six years later, another girl, 12-year-old Tammy Leakey, disappeared just a few blocks from where Sharon had gone missing. Her body was found one day later. She had been raped, strangled, and beaten to death. Her case remains unsolved as well. An FBI profiler would later claim that the same killer or killers were responsible for both murders. The police have submitted the crime scene DNA to various databases, but no matches have been found. Over the years, police interviewed several people, but none were ever charged. The case remains open and unsolved. Lauren DeMolo was born in Florida in 1990. Her parents were divorced and she was raised by her father, Paul DeMolo, in New York. She had a younger sister with whom she was close. She did not have a relationship with her mother. In her teenage years, Lauren had a car accident and was prescribed painkillers, which led to an addiction that she struggled with until her adult years. In 2015, Lauren gave birth to a baby girl, whom she named Michaela. After having her daughter, she tried hard to stay clean and to take care of her daughter. In 2016, Lauren moved back to Cape Coral, Florida in order to establish a relationship with her mother. However, in 2018, she relapsed and ended up losing custody of Michaela. In 2020, Lauren lived with her boyfriend, Gabriel Pina, in Cape Coral, Florida. She had been dating Gabriel for a few years. Even though she had struggled with substance abuse, her family believed that she was trying hard to get her life back together. She had been working two jobs, one at Taco Bell and the other as a server at a local restaurant. In May of 2020, Lauren had gotten an abortion. Not much information is available about the abortion, but her family says that it affected her mental health. On June 1st, 2020, Lauren was admitted to a mental health facility as she was struggling and wanted to seek help. She was released from this facility on June 18th, 2020 she started looking for a job as she had lost her second job as a server at a restaurant. That evening, she was seen applying for a job at a local gas station on CCTV footage. On June 19, 2020, Lauren's boyfriend, Gabriel, called Lauren's father, Paul, who lived in California, 
and told him that Lauren was missing. He told him that he had woken up that morning for work and had kissed Lauren before leaving. He said that when he returned later that night, he could not find her anywhere. Paul told Gabriel to file a missing persons case and to keep him updated. Two days went by, but neither Paul nor Lauren's sister could get a hold of Gabriel in order to inquire about Lauren. On June 21st, 2020, Paul decided to call the Cape Coral police to inquire about his daughter. However, Paul learned to his surprise that Gabriel had never filed a missing persons report for Lauren. Paul immediately flew to Cape Coral to search for his daughter. Gabriel eventually did file a missing persons report, but it was not until later that evening. However, due to a clerical error, her case was not entered into the database until June 24th. Her family had already started their own search by then. A maintenance worker at the apartment where Lauren lived came forward and told him that he had seen Lauren around 8.15 a.m. on June 19th. She had asked him if he knew any cheaper apartments in the area. He claims that she said that she wanted to get out of the situation she was currently in. Her family found the story strange, as Lauren had paid her rent in full for the next month. Her family did not believe that she would leave of her own accord. She loved her daughter, and she was working hard to get back custody of her. Even though she struggled with addiction in the past, she had reportedly been clean for the past two years. According to her family, Lauren had the same routine for the past few years. She would walk to Four Freedoms Park, located seven minutes from her apartment, at around 8 a.m. There, she would meditate, exercise, and relax before heading back home to get ready for work. Two witnesses reported seeing Lauren heading home from that park at around 8.30 a.m. on June 19th. On June 20th, 2020, Lauren's purse was found by an individual at Four Freedoms Park. The purse contained her key, her ID, and her bank card. The purse was turned over to the park ranger. However, since Lauren was not reported missing at the time, her family did not know about these findings until a few days later. Police brought in cadaver dogs in order to search the park, but no trace of Lauren could be found. On July 2nd, Lauren's burgundy shirt would be found in the park. Interestingly enough, the shirt had been found in the very area which had been thoroughly searched in the days prior. However, during the search, the shirt was not present. Investigators believed that somebody planted it. A test of the shirt confirmed that it did belong to Lauren, but no other evidence could be found. Lauren's sister claims that she went to Lauren's apartment after her disappearance to search for any clues. While she was there, she says that Gabriel arrived and took the television, stating that, quote, obviously Lauren isn't coming back. She asked him if he knew where Lauren's phone was as she could not find it. Upon this request, Gabriel went into the apartment and returned with a fully charged cell phone. Police checked Lauren's phone records, but found nothing except that her last activity on her phone was a video call via Facebook to Gabriel at around 10.30 a.m. on June 19th. Gabriel claims he never received notification for the call. While Gabriel Pina is not considered a suspect in the case, it is worth noting that Pina does have a history of domestic violence. Laura is considered an endangered missing person. Lauren is around 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighs around 120 pounds. She has several tattoos, a large tattoo on the side of her body that reads Namaste, a symbol on her wrist, rosary beads on her ankle, and the symbol NY on her pelvis. She has been missing for almost two years now. The case remains open and unsolved. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of Lauren DeMolo, please call Cape Coral Police at 239 Five seven four three two two three.